So I want to thank the, uh, the organizers for having me here today. And uh, I'd like to also uh, <clears throat> uh, mention my, my co-author, Susan Kegley of the Pesticide Research Institute. Susan and I have been collaborating for, for a number of years on various issues, uh, this, this being one. So uh, that what I'll speak about today, there were those pictures were actually taken in my backyard. It's about the birds and the bees. But uh, it's, it's what I have to say goes a lot further than my backyard. And it's really touching on, on sort of a, a worldwide uh, issue and, and problem. So I, I'll do like a lot of people and just step back a little bit and give a bit of a um, historical context. And most people start that uh, with the birth of the organochlorine insecticides. Now, it actually went back, you probably have to go back 100 years before that uh, to start looking at the way uh, arsenicals and, and other pesticides were really being pushed on the, uh, on the farming community. But the, uh, and, and I think it'll be clear as I, as I go on, is that the, the, the feeling when DDT and the organochlorines came along is that this was the solution to all of the, the insect pests that uh, affected us, both in health and, and in agriculture and in storage of foodstuffs. And it was going to be the, uh, the, the salvation. And uh, Paul Muller, who was the sort of, not the inventor, he didn't discover the molecule, but he was the one who discovered the insecticidal properties of DDT. <clears throat> when he gave his Nobel uh, uh, Prize uh, speech, mentioned the various things that uh, he considered to be, to make the ideal uh, insecticide. And as you can see at the bottom of the list there, he thought the best thing about DDT um, was that it was chemically stable. And well, of course we know that chemical stability has a downside, and that stability along with uh, this, its, its solubility in fats and, and difficult metabolism meant that the materials uh, bioaccumulated, bioaccumulated and biomagnified of the food chain, and that was the, the largely the undoing of, of DDT. <coughs> so, uh, in response to, to pressure, there were some cancer issues that were brought up as well, mother's milk and so on and so forth. Rachel Carson comes along, uh, a lot of mortality was seen also. A major shift uh, away from the organic chlorines to what were then sort of the competing chemistry, the organophosphorus and the carbamate insecticides, the colonesterase inhibitors, uh, legacies of the Second World War research on nerve gases. Um, Definitely not as persistent. We're talking here about days for disappearance from soils, but much, much, much more acutely toxic. So this is an example where again, there was a, just a, a very broad shift of mainstream agriculture away from the organic chlorines to the, to the OPs and carbamates. And the reason I want to mention that is because what we're seeing today is this type of major shift to new chemistry, thinking that it's going to solve all of our problems. Now, just it's kind of hard to imagine just how toxic some of these uh, insecticides were. Uh, and you can do a back of the envelope calculation. One hectare of corn treated with carbofuran, a carbamate that was in wide use that I've spent a lot of my professional career working on. Oh, and I should probably put a stop here and say, because it, may, it might not have been clear from the introduction, an emeritus uh, uh, with the federal government is no longer working for the federal government. So whatever I see here is my personal opinion and is in no way representative of the uh, policy of uh, the Department of the Environment in Canada. Okay, so I just want to <laughs> get that clear. Okay, so, so the average um, hectare of corn at 41 million lethal doses to the average songbird. And I calculated based on industry study that at the height of its popularity, carbofuran used in corn alone, which is largely in the Midwest, was killing between 17 and 91 million songbirds per year. Okay, so this is, a, this is pretty, it's getting pretty serious. And this is why I spent so much time working on this. And, and lots of birds, lots of different species of birds. So this is a list of species from field studies that were picked up dead in carbofuran field trials, uh, US and Canadian agricultural trials only. And you can see, I forget what the total is, it's 80 something 
the number of species and the vast, the diversity of, of bird life and uh, that were uh, being affected is, is quite astounding. And with that compound and others, we got a pretty good idea over time what were the high risk situation for birds. Granular formulations where you take a material and you put it on a little in, uh, particle of clay or sand, very, very dangerous because birds um, need to grit and they would pick it up uh, uh, that way. We have problems where fields will flood and that will attract a lot of birds where they're irrigated. California is a good example. It draws birds in uh, into the fields from the surrounding landscape. Birds that graze golf courses, alfalfa pastures are treated, lots of problems there. When you treat the wildlife habitat directly, of course, as we do in forestry, more problems. Uh, with the OPs and the carbamates, they didn't stick around, but sometimes they were at such high concentration in the gastrointestinal tract of the primary kills that scavengers would also be killed. And of course, whenever you have a virulent poison, people will be misusing it, and there's cases uh, even today uh, in Africa where they're using it to poison uh, troublesome lions <coughs> if they're affecting your cattle. Tragically, uh, another high-risk situation were birds attracted to pest outbreaks, locusts, grasshoppers, and all they want to do is gobble up as many of your grasshoppers as they can, but uh, unfortunately, gluttony uh, pays, uh, has a high price if they have been sprayed with an OP or carbamate. Another high risk situation and one that's worth mentioning because we've now, we're now going to that technology more and more is sea treatments. Uh, historically with mercury, with the OCs, uh, there were already poisonings seen with sea in birds with, with sea treatments. Um, and the reason for that is that they're, they're very attractive on a per acre basis, you're not talking about a very large rate of application, but if you ca calculate the amount of active ingredient of the pesticide on each kernel, uh, that actually you means a very high intake for a bird that's, that's eating the, the seed. Machinery being what it is, the incorporation of the seed is, is never perfect and spills are largely unavoidable. The seeds are sitting there on the surface if it doesn't rain or if they're in a pile, the material stays on them for a long time. And even if they are buried, then birds will come along and dig and scrape and obtain, uh, obtain pesticides that way. <coughs> so I mentioned 17 to 91 million, and I have people say, ah, no, no, no way. I walk my field, and I've never seen a dead bird. And actually, a lot of farmers do see dead birds. They don't talk about it much, but a lot of them do, if you, if you really press them for that, at least conventional farmers we're talking here. Um, most people expect a bird kill to look like the picture on the left, which appeared in National Geographic about uh, an incident uh, in uh, Argentina that I ended up working with as well with the organophosphorus insecticide monocrotophos. It's, it, it's dramatic uh, because, A, because they're very large bodied birds. These are Swainson's hawks. Um, and the reason I got involved is because they move from the Canadian prairies to the Argentine prairies with very few stops in between, and um, we don't have that many left, and they were killing a whole bunch of them in Argentina, so I was dispatched to, uh, to look into it. But you have to understand that even there, it didn't look like that. Those carcasses were gathered up from the sunflower fields around, and they were put in a pile for the National Geographic photography, because I mean, who wants to see a picture of a, of a sunflower field, right, with just maybe one bird with its, its legs up in the air? But the fact of it is, uh, most bird kills look like the one on the right. So there's a Lapland longspur, which is probably one of the most colorful little birds that we have uh, in, in, in farmland. And it's right there in, in the middle of that circle. And I don't know how far back you have to be before you can, you can no, so stop seeing it. But this is meant to say that bird kills typically are, are not highly visible. They're difficult to see. Uh, and uh, most of the time, what we do find is really is the tip of the iceberg. The analogy to the tip of the iceberg really is, is a situation here. So OPs, carbamates, yeah, the one thing they did do was kill a lot of birds, but of course, they're called nesterase inhibitor. Uh, so they, they basically interfered with a basic neurological pathway, cholinergic pathways, which were present in all animal life. And uh, we're, talking, we're talking in a brain, neuromuscular junctions. So, so affecting that pathway, which is 
being affected by <laughs> new chemistry that we'll be talking about um, means that potentially you're affecting a lot of biological processes uh, in the body. So it's, it does more than simply uh, block your diaphragm and, and, and suffocate you. So <clears throat> we were able to show that, in fact, the OPs and the carbamates being used were affecting not just individuals. We knew they were killing birds, but they were actually affecting populations. So at the regional scale, uh, the more pesticide index is just the, the, the more pesticide that you use in a, in a county, the, more, the, 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 the lower the population trend for various species in response uh, to, the, to the pesticide. So on a regional basis, we could show that the, the products, even though they were probably not used on more than about 7% of the crop max, uh, were affecting uh, bird populations, um, birds at the population level. And I just finished a, a, a larger study using your country, actually, because you have better pesticide use information than we do, where uh, I entered various variables into models that look at the decline of uh, farmland birds in the US. And the one factor that keeps popping up like a jack in the box as the strongest determinant uh, for the, the period I was looking at, which was 1980 to 2003, um, was the virulence of pesticides, insecticides being used in the crop. Uh, so that, that uh, really was a, a determinant factor contributing to the decline of, of, of grassland or farmland birds. And it's, uh, you can build some models, which I did, and predict based on pesticide use information which state is going to be the most dangerous for a bird to land in. Uh, so this is the proportion of the cropland where we would expect birds to die. So in the Gulf states, for instance, 20 to 50 percent uh, in, in those years, and this is the, the late 90s, um, uh, 20 to 50 percent of the farmland area uh, has had enough material added to it, enough toxic insecticides added to it, that you will predict that birds will be dying. Now, that started changing uh, in the 90s. And when I plot, I look at a few crops. You, here is there's a number of row crops uh, that are, are put in together, potatoes and corn and so on. And the area <coughs> over which uh, birds are expected to die based on, on the models that I constructed uh, was declining because clearly the, the products that were being used uh, were, were not as toxic to birds. And the main reason for that is that you passed the Food Quality Protection Act uh, which was largely there, it wasn't there to protect birds, it was there to protect children uh, from pesticide residues. And there was growing evidence that uh, uh, OP and carbamate residues were affecting children's neural development. Uh, the, there was also the consideration that children were being exposed from every food that they ate, not just, and then of course the registration had been done on a, on a commodity by commodity basis. And so, EPA all of a sudden was mandated to start looking at the overall combined risk of all organophosphorus insecticides and other colonesterase inhibitors on children. And that meant that a number of uses and products uh, basically went out the door and were replaced. And that uh, resulted in an improvement uh, in uh, the, you know, the, the generally the welfare of birds. Although I do want to make one caveat there is that the, the data on which this is based excludes seed treatment uh, products. And so it's a little bit, I'm not sure that, that, that this is a real, you know, totally real. I think it is to some extent. We know that the products in use today are not as toxic to birds as they were, but I don't think the problems are over. So that's the bird part. Now, what we have switched to uh, is essentially this class of compounds called the neonicotinoids. Now, uh, am, I, am I speaking to the convert? Uh, who has heard of neonicotinoids? Oh, right. Okay, so, great. Yeah, I, I sometimes I, I, I apologize for misjudging my audience. Uh, I, just, I, just, I just had to, to, to make sure. But they were the ones that now have essentially picked up most of the slack uh, from the OPs on carbamates. And I've been looking at them for a few years now, and, and I will be totally honest with you. When they first came in, I was still working uh, for the government. And I looked at them, and at the time, I was battling diazinon, carbofuran, monocordophos. And I looked at these compounds, and I said, ah, 
That's a nice change. <laughs> because the, the, the acute toxicity is definitely a number of notches down from these other compounds. But that feeling of elation changed over time as I started finding more and more about these compounds. I started to realize that perhaps the proverbial from the pan into the fire uh, was, was, was a bit applicable here, or in this case, the perfect storm. So why, why do I think that perhaps they're the perfect storm? Well, they're very good insecticides. Let's, let's, let's just be clear about this. You know, they, I mean, they work like gangbusters. And they're very, very toxic to a very broad range of invertebrates. And of course, you've heard about them in the context of bees. They have had a meteoric rise in popularity, largely because of that shift away from the OPs and the carbamates. And, and this is why I went back to the organochlorines, because it's the same wholesale shift away from one chemistry and into the other, uh, and, 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 and a very rapid one at that. They affect the same nervous pathway as the cholinesterase inhibitors, but in a, in a different way. We won't go into the details, um, but certainly with invertebrates, uh, their effect is more or less cumulative in the sense that there's very, very poor recovery of the, the, the neural pathway. Now, what's very important, they're systemic. Systemic means, I'll, I'll, we'll do, talk more about systemic action, but essentially they're throughout the plant. And they're always in a plant uh, whether you actually need it against a pest or not. They're extremely persistent in soil. We, we'll come back to most of these points. Very water soluble and prone to runoff. And also known to cause a lot of sub-lethal effects, behavioral and whatnot. They, they had a very rapid rise in popularity. The best data, of course, is from California because they collect data to the, to the uh, square mile. And you can see from the, the mid-90s, uh, the area reported to be treated. Now, I believe that excludes, Susan, are you here? No. I think that excludes C treatments, actually. So that uh, is, is a bit of an issue. If you look at the scale there, we're talking about the top there is 3 million uh, acres. But if you actually plot out, as Susan did here, the actual area in the US in which they can legally be used, the, the num da, 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 one of my favorite movies. <laughs> the, the, the area is absolutely astounding. We're talking about hundreds of millions of acres. And uh, we now know that in corn, the use is, is complete. Uh, in soy, it's almost there. Uh, canola, you don't have much canola, but we do. Uh, it's also complete. And in cereals, it's increasing. Uh, so that's just the seed treatments. And then you have, you have a lot of other uses. So, so a, a huge, huge proportion of our farmland has the potential to be treated with these products. So to finish off the marketing aspect of the talk, uh, a few facts and figures. In 2010, they made up uh, a just a little over a quarter of the total worldwide insecticide market. Imidacloprid, which is the first one out of the gate, um, is now registered for more than 140 crops. Uh, in 120 countries. Very difficult to find commodities that are not treated with one and sometimes several neonics. A <coughs> um, lot of money involved, uh, 2.6 billion um, in 2009, half of which, or close to half of which is imidocloprid, uh, and it's the second biggest pesticide use after glyphosate. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a lot. And that's an insecticide with a lot of different properties. We, we could talk about glyphosate, but this is something that's designed to kill invertebrates. Uh, and with imidacloprid, again, there's about 20,000 metric tons of it being produced uh, every year, uh, most of which uh, is produced in China, like a lot of other pesticides nowadays. Now, <coughs> they, as they came through, I had the, the opportunity in the report uh, that was mentioned by Michelle to look at a lot of uh, evaluations. And it was quite clear that the scientists at the EPA already had a lot of misgivings about these products when they, they were going through. But again, the pressure to get to move away from the OPs and carbamates and to, to adopt something different was, was very great. <coughs> so with imidacloprid, they already knew it was persistent and mobile. In fact, the company came and said, should we do any more studies on persistence? They said, nah, no, we know it's persistent. <laughs> so <clears throat> they didn't need to do that. 
Um, so you can read for yourself, clothinidin had a number of things that were flagged, thiamethoxam. These are the main three uh, neonics, uh, imidacloprid, clothinidin, thiamethoxam. There, there, there are three or four others, thiocloprid and uh, cetamiprid and so on. But uh, these are the ones that, that, uh, that have probably gotten the most of the fire and most of the, the emphasis in, in Europe and in, in here to a lesser extent. So we already knew, or EPA knew, that to expect adverse effects on freshwater invertebrates, birds, mammals, to the point that they were predicting structural and functional, and, and I haven't seen that one written that many times, structural and functional changes to both the aquatic and terrestrial ecosystem. So this is the, the staff scientist at EPA that said that. Um, and I think we can concur today, and that's, that's sort of the conclusion that we came to in, the, in, in our recent report as well. So let's uh, talk briefly about now, systemic activity again. Now, systemic activity is not new. Uh, there were a number of OPs that had systemic activity. Pyrethroids don't because they're, 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 too, uh, they're too lipophilic. But um, typically, uh, compounds that are they're highly water soluble, uh, compounds that dissociate uh, quite readily in water and form salt, are very, very uh, likely to be translocated inside the plants. It means they can be absorbed through the root and, and move up. And of course, when that happens, then a whole, you know, it, it sort of puts the, the risk assessment on a total di different plane. You're worried about all sorts of other things now because the insecticide is present in all of the plant tissues and the exudates. So you'll find it in the pollen, you'll find it in the nectar. Um, if it's persistent, now this class of compounds happens to be in soil, then you have to be also concerned about rotational crops, you have to be concerned about companion uh, planting, you have to be concerned about vegetation in the edges of fields because they may all be taking it up through soil or through water uh, from, uh, there's trees can pick it up from canals. Um, and that just all of a sudden opens up a lot of other uh, concerns that we'll be talking about. Of course, if, you're, if they're persistent in the plant, then you've got the whole issue of crop residues, mulches, uh, when, when the plant dies and you're trying to reincorporate it into the soil. So, so why, why did the regulators, you know, sort of uh, fall to this sort of siren song of the, of the neonicotinoids? Well, as I mentioned, there was a very large pressure on them to reduce exposure of children primarily to the colonesterase inhibiting insecticides. Um, they, now having said that, they picked a category where, uh, where now I think I, they, they, should be, they should have to do a general assessment on all of the pool residues together because we are now being exposed to residues of all of the neonicotinoids in the same foodstuffs. So that, that's an interesting one. They uh, don't appear to have learned their lesson there that FQPA said there's this risk cup concept that you have to look not just at, at one food, uh, but just all the foods that are treated and treated with all of the chemicals with the same chemistry. And we're seeing that again in spade with, with the neonicotinoids. Um, <coughs> now, the other thing that they were, they, so they were reacting on one hand to FQPA and a desire to reduce exposure of children to OPs and carbamates. At the same time, a lot of OPs weren't working anymore. There were a lot of resistance issues. And um, of course, when you bring in a new chemistry, <laughs> these resistance issues go, go away and all of a sudden it's a miracle again. And uh, of course, industry is always has a fairly heavy influence there. And again, it's the, that, that sort of, I think, myopic sort of view of, and I bore the, the phrase of war against bu bugs, which was uh, uh, in Will Allen's book. If, you, if, you've, if you've read that book, it's actually very, interesting view which goes back a lot further in time than, than I did today. Uh, but that this was, this was this, this, this sort of feeling that it, it was that or agriculture was, was going down the tubes. From the farmer's point of view, conventional farmers that is, well, they did have some advantages. They weren't quite as likely to give you a headache or kill you. Uh, the, the acute toxicity to the applicators is a lot lower for this class than, than the OPs uh, and carbamates. And, as I said, they work like gangbusters because it was a new chemistry, and the first time you use a new chemistry, boom, it works. And they're very good insecticides. They're too good, that's probably part of the problem. Simple solution in the box, 
Um, it works on hard to get at pests because it stays in the plant uh, and it's extremely persistent and systemic. And at least for the seed treatments, the application rate, again, on an acre basis, is less than, than it was with the UPs and carbamates. There is a downside to this, of course, and as most of you will certainly be aware, that having a systemic product that you apply in a seed or you apply as a drench and is there for the entire season uh, goes totally counter to anything that IPM has taught us over the years. That's sort of throwing away the million dollars of research of IPM that says you, you, know, you scout, you check, you see if you have the pest, uh, you, you think of all the things you could be doing to reduce your pest level, and then as a last resort, if you have to, then you spray. And uh, having the, uh, the, the material there in the plant 24-7 is not IPM, definitely not. Uh, in many, many cases, you don't need it. You don't know whether you'll need it or not. You'll never do, you never will, but there have been some studies that have been done which increasingly are showing that a lot of the use is actually not cost effective. But it's getting really hard now. It's getting really hard to find seed that isn't treated. If you're planting corn, finding a corn seed that is not treated with uh, either clothionidin or thiamethoxam is well nigh impossible. Uh, it, uh, we know it affects soil health, if only because it's extremely toxic uh, for earthworms and other soil organisms. Uh, we're starting to see resistance. I predict that we're probably going to see it quite quickly. Maybe the problem will solve itself that way. Uh, because if you have something that is there all the time and puts constant pressure on the pest, that's just recipe for very quick resistance. Um, uh, impact on beneficials. Um, if there was beneficials, there's, there's, there's uh, cases where uh, beneficials, and I think you'll probably talk about those, where uh, they're, they're being poisoned by eating their, their prey insects or if, if, they, uh, if they, they feed on plant saps. And of course, <coughs> we'll talk about the impact on the pollinators. And I just highlighted ah, yours and uh, one by the uh, Center for Food Safety. There is a lot, fortunately, there's actually a lot of, of good review information on these compounds now. So if you want to know more, there certainly are some very good reports out there, including ours. Um, so I, before I leave birds completely, um, I want to mention that less toxic, but as I did mention, seed treatments have extremely high amount of active ingredient per seed. So I, we're not totally out of the wood yet uh, when it comes to birds. And if you do some back of the envelope calculations, you see that the number of seeds for some of the uses, for instance, corn seed <coughs> with imidacloprid, you can calculate that basically one-tenth of the seed is enough to kill you. So uh, it doesn't, won't kill you quite as fast as the OPs, so the probability of finding the bodies will be even lower than it was before. Uh, but I'm convinced that we're, we're having some casualties out there, but it's just they're not. There have been a few that have come to light in France, but not many. Okay. Who has heard of atrazine? Okay, good one? Yeah. <coughs> atrazine has probably given more trouble to regulators around the world than most other herbicides, largely because <coughs> of its persistence and its mobility. And you find it in every Tom, Dick, and Harry river stream rivulet that drains a corn field will have atrazine in it because of atrazine's persistence and water solubility. So I included atrazine in here. So knowing that, you'd say, well, anything that's worse than atrazine on, that, on those criteria, you really should be very uh, careful with. So I've put two, two values here. One is the groundwater uh, ubiquity index, which is a, uh, essentially an index that tells you the likelihood that uh, the material will end up and will contaminate groundwater. Okay, the higher the number, the worse it is. Anything with a number higher than 2.8 means it's got a high probability of ending up in aquifers, especially if they're shallow. So atrazine had 3.3. Look at the three neonicotinoids, 3.8, 3.7, 4.9. So these are compounds that are headed straight for groundwater. Now, 
they don't, the rates aren't as high as they were with atrazine. So that's a saving grace. But persistence, atrazine, half-life, the time it takes for half the residues to, to disappear, 75 days. The number is vary quite a bit. These are averages, but they, I use the same source with the same people doing the same averaging in the same way. Imidacloprid, 191 days. Thiamethoxam looked better at first, 50 days, but 40% of thiamethoxam is converted to clothinidin, and it has a half-life of 545 days. <laughs> so um, here, I mean, we're talking more than a year. So we are talking, and it's been shown, it's been seen in England. We're talking with accumulation in soil of residues uh, at increasingly higher and higher levels, up to at least three years after uh, applications. I mentioned that there, the neonicotinoids. This is a bit of a busy slide. But I mentioned the neonicotinoids, and then I'll refer you to the uh, to, to our report again if you want more details. I mentioned that they're very toxic to all invertebrates, and that means terrestrial as well as aquatic, crustacea or insects. Um, there is a lot of data on aquatic toxicity of the neonicotinoids. The main message to come out, there's two messages that you should take away from this slide. One, if you look at the right side, the few studies that have come out that have measured both surface and groundwater concentrations uh, of imidacloprid because they were, were just starting to be able to measure the others as well. Those numbers are higher, and the numbers on the left in the table are numbers you should not exceed either from a peak exposure or from a chronic exposure if you want to preserve aquatic life. Now you'll see that there's some EPA numbers there, there's some European numbers, and then there's our numbers. Um, the one thing to note is the EPA seems to think that this material is a lot safer in water than, it, than a lot of other bodies do. Can it, can it wait? Or Those are also micrometers on the, on the, yellow, the yellow chart. They are uh, all microgram, uh, micrograms, micrograms per liters. Micrograms yeah. per same, same, same units, yes. Same units on both sides. So, and with the, with the neonex, uh, you're not talking acute exposure because the, the persistence in soil is so long that the, ma the levels are maintained all year round. That the great study in California uh, where those levels of three microgram per liter was basically season wide at, at various sites uh, because every time it rains a little bit more comes out of the soil and ends up in the water. So essentially we're now seeing both in surface water and in groundwater and I think in my career it's the first time I see this where you have concentrations in groundwater that are high enough to kill invertebrates. And I, I don't know, I, I don't think that's, that's okay. Um, uh, and that's just one compound, that's just imidacloprid. In fact, you need to add up clothinidin, thymethoxam, and the others as well because they all have the same mode of action and they're, therefore their, their effect is additive. Now part of the reason that different organizations uh, have a different view of the safety is that like every compound, but probably even more so than the average pesticide, there's a huge variation in, in the way different species respond to it. So when I said toxic to all invertebrates, that wasn't quite correct. There are some invertebrates out there that are fairly resistant to the uh, neonicotinoids, including Daphnia magna, which happens to be the species that is tested by industry to register products. <laughs> so. So part of the reason that the EPA criterion is so much higher than everybody else's is that they relied almost entirely on Daphnia, whereas the Europeans went out and said, well, wait a minute, mm, there's a few other papers that we can pull from various sources and, and uh, come up with a more credible number. And I, I don't want to get too technical here, but this, I, I have to mention this. All of the testing that's done that basically allows regulators to say whether or not it's acceptable to have these residues in the water in the first place are based on 48 hour tests. Put your, your poor little Daphnia, you stick it in a test tube for 48 hours and then you pull them out and you see whether it's still wiggling or not and then you, 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 you come up with your LD50. Well, as I've mentioned, we already have evidence from California that in some cases the material is there all year round. 
It's just, it's, it's constant amount in the water. And there's work, and I, when I mentioned that uh, from at the, at the molecular level that uh, the compounds act in a cumulative fashion, it's based on these sorts of data. So this is perhaps a little bit hard to, to, to fathom, but you've got a time axis on the left in days, and then uh, increasing concentration. What this shows, and these are all uh, LC50s, median time, uh, medi time, not time, concentration to death of half of your test organisms. What this is showing is that the longer there's a linear relationship between the length of exposure and the toxicity level. So the longer you leave it in the water, then the lower, 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 lower is the concentration that the organism can withstand because it's a cumulative action over time. Worse than that, there's at least one paper that showed that even if you took the organisms out of the contaminated water and then you put them in clean water, that didn't make any difference. They still up and died on you 20 days later or whatever it was. So, so when I look at the, the, the promise of broad contamination of water from these compounds and I look at these sorts of data, it makes me very, very uneasy. Not just me, a few other people as well. <laughs> so um, now I, I have to go back to birds all the time. I, I spent a lot of my career looking at birds. But we, we know that the food supply, that pesticides can affect birds directly. I mentioned all of the kills we're getting with the OPs and carbamides. We also know that pesticides can affect birds indirectly by removing their food supply. And especially young birds, and there's some classic work that was done in, in Britain where they showed that basically the density of insects was directly related to the survival of young partridge chicks. Um, and what we're concerned about now is that we have a number of species declining. One group, for instance, that's in, in, in free fall in both our countries are the, what we call the aerial insectivores. Swallows, swifts, um, flycatchers, um, yeah, primarily those, 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 those three groups not doing well. The vast majority of them are tanking. And it's been suggested, well, they need emergent insects coming out of water Mm, is a link possible. So I have a colleague in Canada, we're sort of looking at this now. It's this sort of thing that makes us wonder, you know, so the neonicotinoids on the prairies are introduced, a couple of years later, boom, you get a, a change of state where the populations are a lot lower than they were uh, before. Although, you know, clearly they, they had a little bit of a decline before they got there. So we're, we're now looking to see, well, is this a coincidence or is this actually related to the emergence? Okay, now to the bees, because undoubtedly, you will have heard of the neonics in the context of bees, yes? Yes. Did, had you ever heard about in the context of aquatic problems? No. Yeah, half and half. So that's, that, I think, is, 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 a, is a miss from the point of the regulators. I think they totally missed that one, and I think, in the end, uh, that's going to be a really important one. Bees, of course, bee kills in agriculture, in conventional agriculture, are not new. I mean, you use an insecticide, Insecticides are designed to kill insects. But the traditional view was that this was a problem that could be managed. It could, you know, and you, you, you talk to the farmer next door, you arrange to have the spring, the timing of the spring, the time of day, the time of the season. You move the hives away, didn't do much for the natural pollinators, but at least with managed hives, uh, you could sort of manage it that way. And of course, it's very anthropocentric because uh, most of the emphasis was on managed bees. Why? Because they're worth a lot of money, and they're very important to our agriculture. Okay. I am, uh, yeah, and, and speaking of managed bees, I mean, um, you're, you're all familiar, I'm not teaching you anything, that, uh, you know, the, the, the loss of, of hives in the U.S. and in Europe and Canada, uh, drop in uh, honey production, which was th this is showing. Uh, of course, there's a lot of issues, not just pesticides, um, and the fact that, you know, now we're coming to a critical problem that I think for the first time the almond crop doesn't have enough bees to go around and, and, and pollinate them. I'm actually more worried about the native bees, as, as probably uh, my esteemed colleague here is as well, because they, they, can't, they can't be managed. I mean, they're there, uh, they're on the field borders, they're in the fields, you can't control that. 
and there's a lot of them. Uh, we've got thousands of, of, of bee species, and I was, I was actually, I took that picture at the bottom right, I was really proud of it, because I was actually trying to take the bumblebee, and it's only after I looked at it that I realized there was a tiny little bee there that was also coming into the same flower. So, so you know, huge diversity of, of, of life habits, body sizes, body types, and we will expect, and we are finding that uh, we, the royal we, because people who do the, 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 the t bee toxicity tests, that there's a huge variation in their response to neonics, some, t some of them more susceptible than honeybees, some of them less susceptible than honeybees. But the fact that we now have systemic, persistent systemic products being used in the crops, and in so much of the crop, has forced a total reassessment of all of the possible routes of exposure. It's no longer sufficient to say, well, you know, Joe, don't, don't spray between, you know, 1st of May and 20th of May because I'm going to have my hives there or whatever, or because the plants are flowering. It's, it's just not enough to do that anymore because the material is inside the plant and it's not going away. So one source of exposure that's been demonstrated is what's called gutation waters. It's water rising up uh, th through the phloem, ending up, and you see that when you go for a walk early morning. Uh, in, in your local pasture, you see these little sort of drops on, on leaves like this, and some bees will go and drink from this. Bees will also go and drink from puddles in the fields, even if those puddles are made up of spray solution. Uh, bees will go and drink uh, from the whorls of, of plants, the, uh, the base of, of plants. I mean, I, I was telling Mace, <coughs> there was evidence years ago with, with the OPs we were killing birds because birds were going into cabbage fields that had been sprayed and they were drinking from the leaf whorls uh, at the base of the cabbage plant. So if there's enough concentrated insecticide there to, to, to kill birds, I mean, undoubtedly, there was a problem for bees then as well. Okay? But now, of course, there's all these other possible uh, sources of water. Another problem that's been well documented, so well documented that in some quarters, they think that's the only problem with neonicotinoids, and once they solve this problem, it'll all go away. Well, I wish. Um, and that's the fact that uh, the material on seeds, when it's applied at seeding, uh, some of it sort of sloughs off the seed through abrasion and is then vented out. And the problem is especially acute with what's called air seeder, the pneumatic-driven drills and the, the air is basically exhausted, and you can see a plume going out, which can actually travel quite a distance. And there have been many, 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 many kills seen as a result of that uh, in, in Europe, uh, in Canada, uh, especially. There, 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 there have been very uh, ingenious experiments where they've had bees in cages sort of you know, simulating a flyby, the dust cloud to see how many flybys a bee would have to do before it, it, it dropped dead and so on. It, there's no doubt about it, this is a very high exposure situation. The, there is a technical answer to that, which is that you make sure that the material doesn't leave the seed and stays on the seed. Uh, oh my goodness, five, are you serious, five minutes? <laughs> oh man, I was, having, I was just starting to have fun. Okay. Um, <laughs> Well, I'll have to go quickly to some of the other stuff. The other, the other, the other route of exposure, of course, is, is ingestion through pollen and, and nectar. And you can do some calculations. And I did some calculations recently, actually, with a study that I think was funded by one of the manufacturers. And basically, the conclusion I came away from is that a bee, this is, this is imidacloprid and citrus, that a bee would receive a potential lethal dose every day it, it went into that citrus grove. And the authors actually say that as well in the paper, and there's a, ba there's a Bayer person on the, as a, on the list of authors. Although they do say, it's quite interesting, so they, they, they make a few assumptions of a bee, uh, how many hours it would fly around, and they'd say um, the amounts that they found, which are up to 3.5 nanogram, Okay, that's one billionth of a gram uh, per bee would be the, the dose, well below the LD50. Well, the lowest LD50 value that they give in the same article is 3.7. So I don't know if 3.5 is well below. Well, I guess it is. <laughs> but in, in my books, it's coming pretty darn close to, uh, to potentially lethal situation. Now, in fairness, there have been other 
LD50 values on Bs that have been generated that are higher, depends on the conditions of the test, conditions of your Bs, the, uh, uh, and, and which Bs they were, and so on. Uh, pesticides can have many different effects, um, and, and especially the, the neonics. I, I, won't, I won't go into this because I am running out of time. <laughs> um, one of the, I, I just kept talking and I just, because of school. <clears throat> one of the interesting things that's coming out to really watch out for is that there have been some in increasing number of reports of synergy between insecticide exposure and disease in bees and that being exposed to insecticides would make you more susceptible to disease. And I know when the, that first came out, I think the companies just kind of poo-pooed the whole idea. It was interesting, I went back to some old, uh, somebody pointed this out to me, uh, to some old, uh, this is the 90s, when Bayer first came out with the midocloprid, and if, I don't know if you've had time to read this or not, but essentially they, they were selling the product for termites, very good for termite control, but it was causing the termites to be disoriented, to have behavioral problems, they weren't grooming anymore, and they would be then susceptible to attack by soil fungi. And I thought, well, if this is the mode of action of your insecticide on one social insect, was it so unusual to think that maybe it's affecting another social insect in the same way, which is what some people have been saying? Okay. Current status of neonicotinoids. This is, I think, uh, I don't know if we anybody's realized this, but a lot of patents on these products are going to expire very soon. Typically what that means is that a whole bunch of companies jump into the fray and start making it. So I think we're about to see a massive increase in the number of producers and products. Um, there have been bans in France going back as early as 1999. It's a real patchwork in Europe depending on the country. As was just mentioned, January 2013, whole uh, uh, Europe-wide ban on some, not all, crops. So there's a moratorium now. EPA has said that their reevaluation will uh, give fruit in 2018. Um, maybe we'll find out about where uh, you're at with your Save America's Pollinator Act. And as of two weeks ago, the Dutch Parliament voted to ban all uses of all neonicotinoids. So uh, I don't know. I don't know the details. I don't know when it will be implemented. But uh, at, at least the the, the, the vote carried the day uh, in the Dutch Parliament. So um, two last slides, and then where where do we go from here? Um, I mean, on a short term, there's some obvious things that we should be doing, and probably I think personally before 2018. Um, and then that's to strengthen the various um, restrictions that we have for the use of these products on blooming plants, not that that will solve everything. Uh, enhancing protection against drift because a lot of the problems that we've seen were in field borders and that's especially important for wild pollinators that are in the, in the field borders. Um, and really what we need to do is to cancel the non-essential uses of these compounds and really limit uh, the uses of neonicotinoids, in my estimation, insured pesticide products are better labeled and improve the assessments of the science. More broadly, I think we've got to step back and say, hey, is this really where we want agriculture to be going? What happened to IPM? What happened to intelligent pest control? And that would allow the, the predatory insects to do their work. Uh, if you need to use them, there are some other products out there. They don't work as well. <laughs> These are really, really, really good insecticides, uh, on, at least until resistance comes up. Um, but you know, more targeted products, semiochemicals, you know, soaps, pheromones, biological agents, and so on. And then one last thing I lied. There's a third one. It's not an agricultural issue, but one thing that has come up, and my my colleague uh, Susan just put up th this particular report. Uh, for uh, Friends of the Earth. People will go to a nursery and they'll buy a lot of flowers and flowering plants to create bee havens and bee-friendly gardens, not realizing that the majority of these plants have been treated with neonicotinoids. And at rates that far surpass the rates that are being used in agriculture because there are no residues to worry about 
and when you're sprinkling the granules on the pot, is you start working out what those rates of application are on a per acre basis, and it's pretty phenomenal. So I'll stop there because I've gone over time. Thank you very much. Thank you.